I think we'll get started. Uh, this has been such a wonderful day, and, and I'm really excited to be a part of this as well. My name is Andy Sellers. Uh, up until about six months ago, I worked here. I was the Corden uh, Dunham First Amendment Fellow here at Harvard. I'm now at uh, BU Law, where I run their technology and cyber law clinic, where we do a lot of uh, FOIA-related work for students that are interested in using FOIA as part of their research. Um, it's been a very interesting time to do a lot of this stuff. Uh, I have a truly all-star panel here today to talk about the outside perspective. And so I don't want to waste any more time and just have everyone quickly introduce themselves and sort of their slice of what outside means, like where they come from. And then we're just going to dive right into a discussion. I feel like the, the past couple of panels and presentations has given us more than enough to talk about. We'll talk for a little while, and then we'll open it up to questions as well. So maybe I'll start with you, Nani, if you want to introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, Nani Jansa Reifenlo. I'm currently a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center and advisor at the Cyber Law Clinic. Uh, until this summer, I was legal director at the Media Legal Defense Initiative, an organization that helps journalists and bloggers defend themselves worldwide. So I guess I'm, I'm the person representing the world, the world outside the of the US. <laughs> 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 I'll try. <laughs> Um, Jamil Jaffer, I'm Canadian, so I'm also representing the world outside the U.S., but, but uh, I, I run something called the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia, which is a new institute that will focus on First Amendment issues in the digital age, and uh, I was until recently uh, a lawyer at the ACLU. Uh, David McCraw, uh, I'm from Illinois, I guess that now almost counts as a foreign country, uh, and uh, I, I am the Assistant General Counsel at the New York Times Company. I head up our FOIA litigation efforts. I'm David Sobel. I live and work in D.C., so I'm not sure where that puts me these days in terms of inside or outside, or I, I don't know what that means anymore. Um, but I have been doing FOIA litigation since the early days of the Reagan administration, so I like to think I have a somewhat broad perspective on trends. Um, for the last 10 years, I have been senior counsel with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, where I do FOIA litigation, um, and I also have other clients, other public interest groups. I've done cases for the ACLU, the Brennan Center for Justice, some news media organizations, so uh, I get to see a fairly broad class of cases, and I, I like to think that also adds to the perspective I have. Great, and so there's been a lot of different things that, that I feel like we can talk about, but I wonder if maybe we can start with um, what we just ended the last panel with. I felt like I saw hands from almost all four of you <laughs> wanting to ask questions of Professor Sunstein. So, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk today about deliberation and protection of deliberation and the fear that government transparency can chill or distort or limit de deliberation. And now um, Professor Sunstein's rather provocative suggestion that um, inputs sh do not inherently have the same value for transparency as the outputs do. I, I wonder if anyone has a reaction to that. Do you think this is all, I think the word that he used was the palace intrigue, or do you think there's actually a way that this actually helps people and saves lives to know who is in the room and who gets to be at the table? I, one, one observation I would have about um, Professor Sunstein's approach is it reflects sort of this insider view that um, that ag government agencies are in a position to decide what the public needs to know or wants to know. And what I think is great about FOIA is it, it sort of gives citizens the right to ask what they want, so you don't have to have any supposition about what the public wants to know or needs to know. Um, so if you look at that as inputs versus outputs, I don't tend to look at it that way, but... I mean, that's sort of what kind of what I hear, that is sort of, a, on the one hand, agencies deciding what should go out the door, and on the other hand, citizens demanding what they want. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that you could make the same analysis about the First Amendment, that covering the political campaign is really important, and perhaps covering the opening of a new Broadway show isn't, but I, I don't know why we should be making that decision in terms of, uh, as a society. Why isn't it that, following up David's point, that's something for the public? So I think they both should be available and that the, the and, and citizens can make up their mind. I just uh, have been litigating a, a case over a, a cabinet secretary's uh, calendar, and what we have been looking at is, is the meetings with the industry. It may be entirely correct that the industry is being warned and they're about to get 
hammered, even though that particular secretary now works in the industry. Uh, <laughs> or it may be it's influenced. not hammered too hard at this. It may be influenced, but it begins by having that information and then finding out what happened. So, so a, a few quick things about um, Professor Sunstein's talk. So, so what one one is. Um, I think there was a kind of underlying assumption about the benevolence of the people in charge, and um, you know I, I don't share that uh, assumption, and um, I wonder how many others do at this particular moment in time. Um, I was going to ask him about he's not still here, right? Um, no. I was going to ask about uh, how you make the decision, how you distinguish an input from an output. Why is an OLC memo and and an input rather than an output, um, if it sets the law, if it establishes the law, presumably the U.S. code is an output, not an input. Why is an OLC memo different? Uh, and then the other thought I, I, I had was just about you know, criminal trial. So if, if you imagine a trial, you know, in which everything was closed to the public, but at the end, at the end of the trial, the judge came out and said, you know, I've considered all the evidence. Um, and I have concluded after careful consideration that the, the person is, in fact, guilty. Um, uh, and that was the end of it. We would all demand, I think, um, you know, input transparency. So, so why do we demand it in that context? Um, you know, why is it important there? I think even Professor Sunstein would agree that it's important there. So why is it important there but not in these you know, other contexts we were talking about earlier? Maybe there's a good answer to that, but it wasn't obvious to me. I can only echo the sentiments that were just said here. I think, I think, in particularly the the one about um, questioning the benevolence of those who have the information to share, um, even when there is a legal obligation to share certain information. From the the practice that I've seen elsewhere in the world, uh, there just seems to be an enormous reluctance, even when requested, to provide information that should be out there, to actually provide this. So, yeah. You know that example that that Professor Sunstein gave about the New York Times reporter whose name I've already forgotten. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> that was, in the interest well, of transparency, that was John Breuder. <laughs> All right, John, John Breuder. I have so, a long so, memory, and I am keeping a list. <laughs> you know, I, I, um, I may, maybe Professor Sunstein is right that the the story was unfair and got it entirely wrong. But it's also conceivable that the people in the room didn't realize that they were caving, and an external observer sees the you know sees, sees those facts differently. Um, so I, I guess I didn't take away from that example what Professor Sunstein wanted me to take away. Okay. Let, let's talk about you know I, I think that um, there's a lot of attention being devoted right now to the incoming presidency. <clears throat> but I think it's worth taking a second and saying we're closing eight years of the Obama presidency, and I think this is a good moment for us to take a step back and reflect on that. We've already heard the famous line uh, earlier today, Quentin Palfrey brought it up, um, when Obama took office and when he was campaigning for office, he, he made the statement that his administration would be the most transparent in history. Um, uh, Quentin Palfrey noted earlier that the, they... they had a hard time realizing that vision, partly because not everyone was a political appointee, some were institutional appointees, and sort of steering the ship towards transparency uh, involved sort of changing a lot of the culture there. But I'm curious to hear from the outside. Was this the most transparent administration in history? David Sobel is already shaking his head. So long. Right, well, so, you know, I intentionally alluded, started by alluding to, you know, having done this since the, the Reagan administration. So I do have that perspective. And... Um, I don't think any administration is transparent. I mean, I, I, I think the, si the similarities are much more obvious amongst administrations than, than differences. I mean, I think, you know, there's a bureaucratic resistance to disclosure. And, you know, they, they sort of say, say things, you know, maybe more in, in a more favorable light, as I would say is, has been true of Obama. Um, but in terms of results, I, I don't think it's been seen over the course of the eight years. Now, the kinds of things that Professor Sunstein pointed to, sort of the proactive disclosures of, you know, this big, big data sets, for instance, was something that, that they, they, they made a, a big point of in the, in the Obama administration. Um, disclosure of the torture memos, you know, it was easy to sort of throw the Bush administration under the bus on that. That was the other... A big disclosure that they point to. 
but sort of on a day-to-day -day basis and in terms of litigation of, of particular cases, there's, there's been no change in policy. You know, one of, one of the directives that came out of um, the, the President's day one memo was that the Attorney General was going to promulgate a memo that was going to um, facilitate this, uh, this new emphasis on transparency. So what Eric Holder directed within the Justice Department was that the Justice Department would no longer reflexively defend all agency withholding decisions. After eight years of litigating cases um, and talking to other litigators who have also filed cases over the past eight years, none of us have ever had a situation where we file a complaint against an agency and then got a call from a DOJ attorney who said, you know, we've looked at this and we've instructed the agency that we're not going to defend this and the information is going to be released. There has been absolutely no change on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of actual litigation. So, so that, those were the th would be the things that I would point to in my own experience of indicating that there hasn't been um, the change that was promised. The, um, unless the president was prophesizing the rise of Edward Snowden, <laughs> because in, in some ways it, there was a great deal of transparency, but that's not what he, he had in mind. Um, and I, I have a, an article coming out uh, which deals with an article that Ralph Nader wrote in 1969 called the Freedom From Information Act. And it's an incredible article. It was published in the uh, Harvard Civil Rights, uh, uh, Civil Liberties Journal uh, in 1969. And what's interesting about it is it was written about FOIA before there were any court decisions. There had only been 40 cases brought. There wasn't any real precedent. And Nader criticizes the conduct of the, uh, of the FOIA officers and how they interpreted FOIA and how slow they were and how cramped their reading of things were and, and all of that. And what I found was that all of that behavior has continued 50 years later, but more than that, it has been validated by the courts. <laughs> that the very things that Nader attributed to essentially administrative sloth, administrative reluctance, administrative resistance, now the courts have said that's exactly how FOIA should be, um, should be interpreted. And I think that I bring that up in, in terms of response to the question because I do think that whatever the intentions of the president were, and I think that I, I will give him credit, I think they were good intentions, that the fact is that it was the steps that would have been needed to actually move the bureaucracy were never taken the kind of things that free FOIA officers to make decisions to say yes, which is always a risk, as opposed to say no, which is always the safe alternative, and also just to have the funding to do what was necessary. I, I don't think those kind of steps were taken after the good intentions of, of the first year. Yeah, we don't have anyone from the administration on the on this panel, I guess, you know, maybe by design, but 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 um uh, you know, I've talked to a couple of administration lawyers recently, and Charlie Savage has this in his in his book too. Um, some people in the Obama administration have said, you know, the the reason why we didn't release more was that you guys filed these FOIA cases, and you know, had you not asked for this information, uh, sorry, I tried to say that with a straight face. Um, <laughs> had you not asked for this information. Um, you know, we wouldn't have felt obliged to sort of dig our heels in and draw these legal lines, and we wouldn't have had to worry about, you know, the future, you know, the next case. And it could have been a discretionary release. And, um, and you know, I, I'm, I have a kind of vested interest in the answer to that question, like whether that's a, you know, a, a real phenomenon or not. But uh, I guess I'm curious to know what others on the panel think about uh, that argument. My parents took the same approach to Christmas. If I ask, I didn't get it. So <laughs> I, I, I don't know what that is. Uh, but it, you know, I, the idea that somehow that by going to court we were making it worse, given the treatment we were getting before we went to court, is mm -hmm. preposterous. I don't. And and I, I guess as I look at this, is that that and for those of us who go to court a lot, um, is that. You know, the decision for what should be public shouldn't stay in the hands of a FOIA officer. And that's what happens when people don't litigate. And it's ju it, to me, it's a lesser version of what happens in the criminal justice system. The cop arrests somebody. 
There's no real defense attorney brought in that's going to care about the person's case. The judge wants it pleaded out. And pretty soon, the cop's decision decides who goes to jail. That's not how the system is supposed to work. And I think the same thing about FOIA. The FOIA officer is not supposed to be the last word because people are going to shrug and walk away. And, and that's why I think the, the litigation part is so important. And I resent the notion, as Charlie reported, that somehow we're being punished by asking the courts to make an independent determination. So unilateral, unilateral promises are easily broken. Unilateral decisions uh, sort of the lowest common denominator. What, what are the structural things that a government can do to ensure transparency? What are the ways in which a government can sort of, you know, to borrow from, from Howard, like tie itself to the mass, to force it to disclose even when the people involved and the people who are holding the records um, don't want the information to go out, but yet, nevertheless, the information should go out. Nani, I wonder if you've seen anything, because you've seen several different legal regimes um, that have handled freedom of information. Have you seen anything that's especially effective at ensuring disclosure or ensuring transparency? I'm afraid I have not. Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the things that I think is one of the biggest obstacles, actually, is the, is the whole procedure uh, in challenging decisions that you do not agree with about disclosure of information. Um, and you can see that the bureaucracy can be very, very effective in just obstructing and delaying, etc., so that the information that someone is after is either outdated by the time it might eventually get released, uh, or people just get lost in an administrative uh, maze, basically. Um, You've seen in Africa a big rollout of access to information model laws, which then um, are adopted but do not fit together with the rest of the system, leaving people being pointed from one institution to the next, etc. People don't really know how to file a complaint and where to file a complaint. When do you actually end up in court? You know, but I mean that's one example. I think a lot of people will have seen what had happened uh, in the UK with uh, Prince Charles's letters. Uh, that also took, you know, quite a number of years of, of litigation, and of course, you know, lots of firepower from from a big paper, let's say the Guardian, uh, that was really willing to pursue that. Um, I think for bigger news outlets, that's more feasible, but for smaller or independent reporters or individuals, it becomes really cumbersome. Anyone else? Well, I was just going to, you know point out the, the resource problem that uh, agencies don't have the resources, I mean, in terms of the, the problem of delay, uh, you know, they, they don't have the resources because they don't want the resources. I, I, they, they welcome the opportunity to be able to point to the lack of resources when they get sued after they've sat on a request for a year. You know, they, they have their, their boilerplate declarations all ready to go about how limited the resources are and they, they don't have any staff. And, you know, they never make an effort to address the problem because they, they don't want the resources. Um, I've always thought it would be an interesting exercise uh, for, for the congressional committees uh, that oversee FOIA to look at the agency public affairs budgets and see how much money they spend sort of putting out the stuff that they want, sort of the, the, the happy stories about what a great job the agency is doing versus the amount of, of money and resources that they devote to answering FOIA requests um, that is driven by what the public wants to know. And I suspect that uh, the FOIA resources would be a very small percentage of the larger agency uh, public affairs budget. I think that's interesting because that's a that's a different take than what we heard earlier today too. Because I think I think Amy, you might have mentioned this too, is that the um, the that a lot of solutions or proposed solutions for agencies are technology deployments, better records management, better email management. The problem is that those are too resource intensive; that the agencies don't know how to use them, or it just takes up too much computing power, it just takes up too much whatever power for them to actually do that. Do you do you buy that, or do you think that this is actually a convenient excuse? Uh, I, th I think to a large extent it's a convenient excuse. I mean, it's just it, w when, when the head of an agency is deciding what he or she wants to seek resources for, I have to think that FOIA is very far down on the list. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's, it's a really good question because we all end up complaining about the system and you know, what, what's the solution. And, and I think there are some things beyond the resource problem, which is real, that, that would help. I mean, one is that the FOIA officers don't have enough independence. 
And until you have a system where they're not beholden to the agency and they're not going to get in trouble with the agency, I think it's hard to be very optimistic about it. In Mexico and in some other places, there is an agency that operates independently of the, of the particular agencies that have the documents and has the power to override that particular agency. Until you have that, uh, you, you're, gonna, you, you're, you're going to have FOIA officers who may be very well-meaning, may want to do the right thing, but are, but are caught up in, in the realities of being in big organizations. There was a FOIA case that I had several years ago now where a FOIA officer emailed uh, a Times reporter with a very standard response that we, we, you know, we have diligently looked for documents and we have found no documents and we're continuing the search and we ex expect sometime in the next century that they will be, that we'll consider, we'll, it will end this, this search. <clears throat> Followed immediately by an email from the same guy saying, somebody just made me send that, it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I think the only thing that's rare about that probably is that he had the honesty to say that. But I think that, that also, and I'm going to come back to the courts here, I do think that the agencies through the Justice Department are moved when there are court rulings, and the courts have really let us down. If you look at what happened during the Hillary email FOIA cases, what you see is the State Department and the intelligence community in an argument over what's classified. And the State Department spokesman says in September of 2015, it is, classification is not black and white. You then see the president going on television and saying, there's classification, and then there's classification. And then you read uh, the, these emails which show that they were actually negotiating promises to the state was that negotiating promises to the FBI that if they would back off on a classification decision, maybe they would have an extra FBI person in Beirut. And you see they're just negotiating it politically. If federal judges could be as brave as State Department flax and say it's not black and white, but too often we see on these classification decisions, the government rolls in, has the declaration, says this has to be classified, and the judge says, I have to defer to that judgment. Changing that would change a lot. You know, the, the, other, uh, the other piece of that is that, you know, so there is this sort of question of what, what is classified or what should properly be considered classified. Um, and I agree, it would be great if judges uh, would get their hands dirty in that question more often. Um, but then even once it's determined that something is properly classified, um, you know, in many other countries, or at least in some other countries, um, uh, there's a public interest override possibility, right? So, yes, um, there's a national security justification for keeping something secret, but the public also has an interest in making some of that, you know, a subset of that information public. And there, there really should be something in uh, the statute that expressly contemplates a public interest override, because there's always going to be an argument. The, the government's always going to have an argument about um, possible harm from disclosure. It'll always be possible for the government to point to an exemption uh, when it wants to withhold a, a document. The real question we should, we should be asking is not, is there a cost or a possible cost to disclosure, but is that cost outweighed by the public benefit of, of disclosure? And that's not a question that our system asks. The judges aren't, don't think themselves empowered to ask that question, and the statute doesn't expressly give them the power to ask that question. I just want to quickly mention on the point of the judges. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree that to, to some extent it's a lack of courage to sort of, you know, do anything but to defer to agencies. But I also think certainly in D.C., where I practice and where most of the FOIA litigation takes place, it's a matter of self-interest on the part of the judges because they hate FOIA cases. And they don't want to create any incentives to litigators to come bring more cases in the belief that we're going to get anything as a result of litigating. I mean, I, in, in some context, in the context of delay, for instance, where you file a case after an agency has sat on a request for a year, I've had judges tell me that there's no way I'm going to send the message that somebody just has to file a lawsuit to get a faster response to their FOIA request. So that, that's at play here as well. Sure. I want to move uh, off of FOIA a little bit and talk about um, transparency more general and, and, and the way in which digital technologies have changed this a little bit. 
So we have a new administration coming in, perhaps you've heard. There's coming in in part of what I'd say has been an arc recently about the role of um, presidential communications in informing the public. So if we go back before Obama, certainly before Bush, if the president wanted to get a message out to the public, they had to go through the White House press corps and would have to then be subject to the scrutiny that being before the White House press corps, having their press secretary before the White House press corps exposes the questions that naturally follow when a, when a president makes a statement. Um, starting with the Obama administration, I would say in particular, there's been a real push to communicate directly with the public. And that's good on some levels, but it's bad on some levels because it means they're no longer exposed to that um, scrutiny. With the Trump administration coming in, I'd say we're not just angling towards circumvention. We are angling towards a direct attack on the press and the press corps. Uh, as of this morning, Trump has tweeted 24 times since being elected president. 19 of those appear to be uh, actually from him, using the classic Android versus iPhone test. Um, <laughs> Just under half of those, eight of those, were direct attacks on the media. Not for nothing, David McCraw, six of those were direct attacks on uh, the New York Times. The failing New York Times. Yeah, yeah, let's get this going. Yeah. By the way, you had some They'll subscription numbers right. come up, right? Some subscription numbers came up today. You guys are actually up quite a bit right now. But um, We want to get the right hashtag on this. That's right. <laughs> got to help on this. Go to that one. Um, what what comes next, Nani? I may I want to start with you again. So, ha, have you seen this in other countries? And and what are we in? What are we in for here next? <laughs> with with a with a dueling administration going after the press directly instead of just trying to work around the press. And name the countries. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Going to have a little uh, hall of shame here. Uh, yeah, please. Um, I'm not quite sure what to say here. Uh, legions of really bad examples. So I, I, I have to say, though, that um, I'm not that pessimistic uh, as regards the defense of the press in this country. You have a very uh, strong First Amendment tradition. You have excellent lawyers here. You have excellent courts. Uh, I think you know that the first hit will be very unpleasant. But I think in the longer run, um, that that should be balanced out. I'd like to think so, anyway. I mean, uh, you are here, after all. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. The people who litigate in the system are often would be the ones to, to speak to that more than that. Uh, yeah, I David, I'm, I may turn to you directly here. Um, because not, in addition to Trump's attacks on the Times, you yourself became a bit of an internet celebrity this cycle um, <laughs> because you were the author of a response to a cease and desist letter um, that Trump sent the New York Times. Um, that probably if we gave out awards for best cease and desist response 2016, I would nominate this response. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> are you worried? Are you are you afraid of what comes next? Uh, now, you, you know, I I I I'm not in part. Uh, now I sort of uh, and is anticipated my response, it's, uh, and, and maybe I'm with Dave Chappelle on this. That just give him a chance if he'll give us a chance. Um, you know, it seems to me that at some point there's going to be real news again. There's going to be a terrorist attack. There's going to be a Russian invasion of Ukraine. Some, Russia's going to take over Latvia. Something in Mosul is going to happen. You know, something that's a real news event. And I think when that happens, we will finally see how the system of covering the president is, is going to work. I think at this point, when we're still in the hangover from the, from the election, and the way it was covered and the way the appointment process is now being covered and so forth, it's sort of uh, turned in on itself. Um, that said, and, and, I'm not, and, and I'm not very concerned about the, uh, there becoming some sort of change in the, in the libel laws, their state laws, there's the, it's the United States Constitution. I just don't think the president's going to be in a position to really do uh, damage or good on that front. The, um, but I, I am concerned about leak investigations. We had too many in this, this current administration. I fear that will continue. Subpoenas on the press as part of that. The Obama administration actually showed a lot of restraint uh, uh, as far as actually subpoenaing the press, the reporters. There were a couple incidents, but by and large, there's a lot of restraint. I'm not sure we're going to see that. I would not be optimistic about uh, a grander look at FOIA. Um, and I think probably around the margins we will see some, some pushback in the law. But primarily, I think the thing that, that to watch is, is, does the relationship between 
the White House press corps and the White House normalized? Do they find some way to get back to something that looks a little bit like it does now? I don't think that uh, the Trump administration is going to take away his cell phone, so I think his tweets will continue to be a major <laughs> form of uh, mm-hmm. release of information. But um, I, I, I'm not sure that, that that's going to change the republic. And maybe that raises another question about the difference. There's been a lot of consternation. I think that, you know, to, to, to sort of build upon Professor Sunstein, he had this difference between input transparency and output transparency. I may say a difference between transparency and accountability um, as being a, a, a distinction that's raising a lot of concern right now. So um, just to take the example of Steve Bannon for a second, who... I guess at your most charitable, you could say he surrounds himself with a, a lot of anti-Semitic and racist people. At your least charitable, you say he is racist and anti-Semitic. Everyone knows he's going to be appointed to this position. It's not a question of transparency. It's just a question of what, what, what can be done about it. Um, do we think that the Trump administration is going to give us a lot of concern for secrecy? Or do you think it's going to be brazen defiance with no clear check? Well, it's a little of both. I mean, I think the the income tax example is sort of, you know, brazen secrecy, right? It's like, we're not going to tell you and, you know, F you. That's that's the end of the story. Defiance is, is in some ways too, too um, optimistic a word. I mean, the, you know, the truth is if, if enough Americans protested, he probably would remove Steve Bannon from whatever position he's now in. Um, you know, but transparency is no guarantee of the result that you want or I want, right? That's um, the unfortunate fact, right? It, it, you can be the, the government can be transparent, and most citizens can be okay with whatever the government is doing. So, in that particular area, I'm not sure the complaint is about transparency or accountability, but rather about um, you know our fellow citizens um, to different complaint. The, uh, I want to spend a little bit of time also, um, because it came up in some of our discussions before, about the decision not to publish information. Um, we, we've been talking a lot about transparency and how do we ensure greater transparency. And um, curious as it sounds, there are times when um, an activist or a journalist um, or a other person who's seeking to inform and enlighten the public obtains a piece of information from the government that they determine is not safe or prudent or responsible to disclose. Um, I I wonder if each of you could maybe speak about a a time when that might have happened for you and what was the calculus in your head? Why did you decide to impose secrecy um, at a time when at least the government, through either intentionally or unintentionally, did not? Um, I have encountered situations uh, where an agency has, in response to a FOIA request, I believe inadvertently released some personal information relating to third parties. Um, And given that uh, most of the FOIA work I have done has been on behalf of of organizations that are sensitive to and supportive of of privacy rights and advocate for those rights, I felt that those were circumstances where we, in effect, needed to make the editorial decision not to be as, um, as, as transparent, if you want to put it that way, as the government was. But again, they were under circumstances where it appeared to be inadvertent. Uh, and uh, an inadvertent disclosure of something that didn't implicate privacy rights, I don't think I would have felt you know, as obligated to, uh, to make that decision. But where privacy was at issue, I did. Well, you know, and the New York Times has been all over this issue in, in various ways. Uh, the Holding the warrantless wiretapping story for a year um, was a decision that has been criticized a lot. I don't think it would be made quite that way today. But I think that there is... You see in that, and you see in WikiLeaks, and you see, to some extent, in the Snowden disclosures that a system had normalized itself, that we receive a leak of information, our editors make an initial judgment about newsworthiness and public interest. There is a dialogue with the government where it is, to me, the same thing as any other routine reporting. 
you're trying to find out, is there something more we should know about this? And as long as the editors retain the power and the right to say no to the government and publish, then I think that system works. And I think it actually assures, to a certain extent, that the right information ends up getting released. Um, it, that system, I think, is breaking down to some extent. The Times ran into this when um, it was reporting on a threat in the Middle East and went to the government, was about to report it. The government asked that certain details not be reported. The Times decided that the important part of the story could get out. They could withhold these the, the details of how the information had come to the government and was greeted by finding that the McClatchy newspapers had not talked to the government and published the details. And our reaction was, look, you know, it, we all have to play by the same rules or not. We're not going to get scooped for being good citizens. And um, I, I think that now there is much more of a tendency to publish and let the information out. I think in many cases that's a really good outcome. I think in other cases it, it actually poses some risk, and it would be much better if we continued to have that dialogue and then made the decision. We, we almost had um, an issue like this at the ACLU. Um, we, we were litigating for the release of the, the abuse photographs that hadn't been leaked with the Abu Ghraib photos. And um, we eventually learned that there were 2,000 of these photographs that hadn't been published. And we won in the district court uh, in, in 2005. Uh, a judge uh, in New York ordered the government to disclose the photos. We won in the Court of Appeals. And then when uh, the Obama administration um, came in in 2009, they, they said they would release the, the photos. Um, after they said that, um, we... Um, we, we sort of um, suddenly, you know, we're not often in the position of, of winning. Um, so we, we started, you know, we started thinking about how, well, what are we going to do with these photos now that, you know, we have been saying for, for, you know, for five years or six years, you know, we need, um, the public has a right to see these. And we, you know, we, we, we believed that. Um, uh, and we said that the, the photos were important to the public record and we, we believed that. Um, uh, but the government had been arguing from the from the beginning that if these photos are released, they will be used as propaganda by our enemies, and they may even uh, be incendiary and provoke violence against American civilians and American soldiers. Um, and you know the courts disagreed with that, but we knew that if we released these photos and there were riots somewhere in the world and somebody died, that that we'd be held responsible uh, for it. And so we were very worried about, um, you know, about the release of the information, and, 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 and we thought a lot about what, responsi what a responsible release would look like. And the decision we came to was, was that we would uh, include a couple news organizations in, um, uh, in the decision about uh, both what to release of the photos that we, um, that we got uh, and how to release them. The, the way the FOIA works is, you know, once once we we won that victory, then in theory anyone could ask for those photos and 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 put them out there. So you know, there's only so much control we had at that point. But we thought that you know we're not going to be we want to be responsible agents, and if other people are going to be irresponsible, that's you know that's their issue and not ours. Now, as it turned out, you know, depending on your perspective on this, you know, we we got uh, we got we got lucky, and. Uh, 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 the, the Congress retroactively amended the Freedom of Information Act to, to carve these photos out. Uh, and so now we are back in court, or the ACLU is back in court, uh, fighting about the scope of that retroactive carve out. Um, maybe some, sometime in the next century, somebody will get hold of these photos and have this issue again. But uh, it, was a, you know, it was a very hard set of decisions for us when we thought we were about to get these photos. And, and I do think that you know, if you come into information through this process or any other process, you have, you know, you have uh, a judgment, at least a kind of moral and yeah, moral judgment about um, uh, about what should be released and what shouldn't. I, I actually thought you were going to talk about the inadvertent release of documents. But no, case, I, 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 <laughs> we had that too. Right, right. Right. The, right. I, I had a long-running FOIA case against the NSA. 
uh, Department of Justice, CIA, you know, sort of the intelligence communities. And they were making a production of documents. Uh, is, this one was from the DOJ. And they inadvertently released a uh, classified document that it came as part of the FOIA release. And, and it came late at night. And I just passed it on to the reporter, because that's what we do, because the government always says we're going to post them, and we don't want to get scooped. So sent the documents to the reporter. And the reporter found that the most interesting document in the whole pile, of course, was the classified document that shouldn't have been released. And as you can imagine, my cell phone started ringing the next morning. My, my uh, email lit up. My office phone started you know, going off the hook. And it was the government asking me to give the document back. And then they spoke the, uh, the, the most chilling sentence you can have in that and this was, when it happened to the ACLU, they gave it back. <laughs> 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 Hashtag WTF. <laughs> so my next call was <laughs> Did you meal. We had a really interesting conversation, though, and, and because it wasn't, it, it, it's more nuanced than you think, because I think you guys had decided when it happened to you that it wasn't that important of a document, and you're playing in a different space than we are. Well, yeah, so we were, we, we, in that case, we were, in the case where we gave the document back, we were litigating, um, uh, Jonathan might have been at the ACLU at the time. We were, we, we were, although this happened more than once, we were, we were litigating for the release of the document. We felt that we were, if somebody had given this document to us, uh, you know, we weren't in litigation, we would never have given it back to the government. We would have published it. But we're also officers of the court. We're, um, you know, we're repeat players before the Southern District. Um, we're repeat players with the DOJ. I hated and, this part of the phone call. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know, you and I, I made the argument, I think, to you that, that you're in a different situation because you're a news organization, and I think you weren't. Uh, were you litigating for that document it, at the time? There had been a schedule right. set by the court. Uh -huh. There had been no right. order given, but the court had approved a schedule for the review and the release of, of records just like they do in, in so many cases, and then you decide whether you want to have motion practice over it. So there was, right. to a certain extent, you're absolutely right, the court was involved. Mm -hmm. right, uh, so you have multiple audiences where, that you need to be concerned about in terms of reputation, yeah. right? Yeah. It's not just your readers, but the judge and... Yeah. Right, and, and yeah. I, you know, the idea of going to a reporter and saying you have to give it back <laughs> and having that person say, well, what about if it had come from Edward Snowden? What right. if it had come from Julian right. Assange? What if it had come from Daniel Ellsberg? What, 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 what? I mean, what, how can this be different? The government gave this to you mm -hmm. <laughs> legally as part of a FOIA mm -hmm. re response, and um, that didn't mean I was really certain of my position either. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I kept saying to the AUSA, um, you know, have the NSA call the editors, and then they did. The NSA called the editors. They had a very standard decision as if it had been a leaked mm -hmm. document. Uh, the New York Times made its decision to, to publish, I think, almost all of the document. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the AUSA called back, and at that point I said, we should go, we should have the judge decide this, because if I, want, if I was going to go tell a reporter that he had to give a document back, I at least wanted to say a judge, <laughs> and not me, was, was making that request. And it turned out it was a, a, a newsworthy document. It dealt with what phone companies were actually working with the NSA uh, in, in providing metadata and the collection of metadata. And the, the AUSA decided not to get on the phone to the court, which was a really happy moment in my life. Mm -hmm. Well, we we've had those we had those issues actually multiple times, and I, I don't think they were any of them was ever resolved in a satisfactory way. There's another instance in which we got a document uh, the government said was classified and that had been given to us inadvertently, in the context of FOIA litigation, and, and we took it to the judge, and and uh, or maybe the government ended up taking it to the judge. I can't remember who went to the judge first, but. Uh, and we argued to the judge that we should be entitled to release it because it was in, not properly classified and we lost. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask the, uh, what I sometimes call the honey or vinegar question. <clears throat> so a lot of people, I, th I think especially recently, there's been a lot of energy around doing public records requests yourself and, and trying this out. And, and you know, I, I'm an attorney who has brought FOIA into my practice fairly recently. And I had this question when I first started doing these requests for my clients was, you know, 
do I approach this like I would any other negotiation? Do I try and be value creating? Do I try and be friendly? Do I appreciate the fact that um, you know this this is a human on the other side of the line, and if I'm nice to them, maybe they'll they'll throw me a bone? Or do I just go hard and fast litigator? Or do I just you know be be as rough and direct and 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 slam the law down as much as possible? I started with the honey. The more and more I did the honey, the more I, I realized the vinegar might be the better option. Um, but what has been your experience? How, how, how do you balance that between being the trying to be friendly, trying to be source cultivating, trying to get that second email after the first serious email saying that was just formality. In truth, we do have a record here um, versus just you know relying on the law and relying on the system of the law to get to the result you're looking for? Well, I think it's very much a matter of personalities and relationships. I mean, it, you know, I, I can't say I have one approach in all of my cases, because it depends very much on who's on the other side. Um, but I, I would say, as a general matter, I mean, I see FOIA litigation as sort of a chipping away process. I, I know that some attorneys who sort of come to FOIA cases um, after having a lot of experience doing other kinds of cases are sort of amazed at the idea that eventually you might get to a point in a FOIA case as a plaintiff where you'll voluntarily dismiss the case. Um, but that's kind of how it works. It's sort of this drips and drabs of getting more information. Sometimes you don't actually get the documents. Jamil and I were just talking about this earlier, but you learn something in the course of litigating the case in, in a declaration or, or, or something short of the actual documents that you started out trying to get. So, you know, it's very much case-specific in terms of the circumstances and also the individuals who are involved. Yeah, and I, and I thought the presentation earlier by uh, the folks from, from uh, Muckrock was right, that there is a lot of information you get. A lot of stuff that ends up in litigation were sort of at the fringes of FOIA and pushing the law and pushing uh, the right of access. But there, there is a, a base of documents which, which you can get. And I think in those cases, working with the FOIA officer and, and, and being um, positive about it and, and trying to uh, think of ways to solve whatever his or her problems are in terms of rolling production or redaction or what documents are going to be difficult is, 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 is a good approach. Um, in in the, the city of New York, when we have state FOIA, FOIL issues, um, some of the, the reporters are really good at this. And I always sort of say, you should think of, you should think of using FOI if you are a reporter as just another form of reporting. It is not a vending machine. You don't put your request in and the, and, the, and the can of Coke falls out the bottom. You have to do what happens at the New York Times. You have to shake the machine. <laughs> you have to hit it. You have to keep working at it. To try, you pray. You do all these things in front of the machine to make it deliver the document. And it's the same thing. But I, I was working with one reporter who was doing a story, uh, two reporters who were doing a story on foster care. And it was kind of brilliant. One of the reporters set up a meeting with the head of the agency and the FOIA and the FOIL officer, me and the reporters. And of course, the head of the agency is going like, New York Times, we're going to give you everything you ever want. <laughs> and the FOIL officer is going like, <laughs> you know, and, and it was really kind of a beautiful bit of, of, of reporting because it, now you had the head of the agency committed to helping you on your story and, and the FOIL officer had no place to turn. Can, can I just m mention in terms of, you know, David talking about his experience representing the New York Times and me talking about representing my clients with a <laughs> reputation of, you know, having litigation expertise. What I worry about is the average citizen who doesn't have the wherewithal um, to sort of stand up to the barriers that are thrown in, in front of them, whether it's fees or delay or, you know, it's not a proper request. I mean, you know, so it... It, it, it's, it can work to some degree for those of us who have the, the, the resources and expertise and wherewithal to pursue it. But sort of for the average requester, I mean, I have had real concerns for, throughout my career about sort of where, where people are generally left in this process. And so let me, let me raise a, a point that Michael Morrissey from Muckrock raised during his presentation. He expressed his dis, distaste for the, for the phrase public records don't work unless you sue. Do you think they don't work unless you sue? Look, I mean, he, he has more direct experience sort of on that end of the spectrum, but my perception is, um, you know, my, my clients would not have gotten nearly uh, the kinds of results they've gotten if we didn't have the ability to go to court. I, I think that's, 
Uh, that's consistent with my view, but but you should recognize that the three of us end up litigating the most politicized right. cases, right? So they're the ones where where the the government is most likely to dig in its heels. I mean, there are, you know, if you're if you're asking, you know, if you're outside the national security sphere, outside law enforcement, you know, I think it's a little bit easier and. You, you still have there's still a lot of issues you have to deal with, uh, including the fact that the system is so clogged with with quests. But but um, you don't always come up against the resistance that you sort of affirmative resistance that you come up against uh, with with national security issues at least. Have you had to sue mainly to get the transparency you've been looking yeah, for? Yeah, I just want to say, like, you, you, of course you get kind of a skewed view as a litigator because only certain types of cases end up on your desk, and particularly at MLDI, only certain types of cases end up uh, on our desk. Um, but, yeah, those would always be situations in which any honey <laughs> would not have made any difference. Um, name a country like Azerbaijan, uh, information that really should have been released under the exit information law. If you get a no there, you get a no throughout the entire legal system. The only way you can go is the European Court of Human Rights. So, um, yeah, there's, there's no, you would, you'd just be wasting your time uh, yeah. by asking nicely again and again. I said, a few years ago, I was working with a group in Kuwait, which was writing a, a, a freedom of information law. And we get to the end of their, of their draft, and, their, and the end of their draft says that if the FOIA officer does not meet the deadline, then he's subject to a one-year jail term. <laughs> and, <laughs> That's good. And, as, 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 you know, and, and so, you know, as, as, a, as a human rights type lawyer and, 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 and global norms type lawyer, I, of course, you know, felt like I should say, well, you can't really do that, yeah. right? But as, as, a, as a veteran FOIA requester, I'm going like, that's not really a bad idea. <laughs> Great incentive. Yeah. Right, right. Um, I, I want to ask one more question, and then I want to turn it up to the room. Um, the, so, so you have been successful arguing uh, in Europe that, that the right of access to records is a constitutional right. Or you've been making that argument, <laughs> and that argument has some traction. There are cases that you can cite uh, under Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights that seem to suggest a right of access to records. The United States has not had that much luck with that argument generally. When you're talking about court, you're talking about court records. There's actually some great cases on point. But once you get outside of the court process, you, you're more in just a pure statutory land. Mm -hmm. Do you find that makes a difference when, you can, or when you're able to sound the argument under a constitutional or a an uh, international uh, yeah. agreement? I should probably nuance that a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, a, a decision came out from the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights last week, which was a big step in the right direction <laughs> towards acknowledging a full-fledged right to access to information under Article 10 of the European Convention. Um, unfortunately, uh, the European Court is not as wonderful as for example, the Inter-American Court, which is just flat out said, like, yes, there's a right to access to information under Article 13. You just have to meet the three-part test, and for the rest, there's not a lot of discussion. The European Court um, has an approach that says, like, yes, there can be a right to access to information uh, if you are a public watchdog, which could be an NGO, it could be a scientist, could be all sorts of things, if your intention is to make this information available to the wider public. Uh, I seriously do not know why they are taking such a long time to step in line with the Inter-American Court, the UN Human Rights Committee, etc. But anyway, it, they're slowly getting there, uh, I hope. Um, I do think that um, generally this judgment is seen as something that would really reinforce access to information litigation throughout the Council of Europe. Uh, there have been a number of cases that were pending and that have been put on hold uh, awaiting this judgment. So I hope there will be positive outcomes uh, there. So, yeah. As litigators, do you think that you'd have more traction being able to, same substance, just being able to point to the Constitution? Well, it, it, would, it would, would help. First, we have to establish that. And Jonathan says he's going to. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, 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 we are doing it, the closest we're doing it now is for when we make a FOIA request for records from an administrative adjudication, it is not uncommon for us also to write a letter to the 
in, in the case I'm thinking of, the immigration court, saying, we think you are a court. We think under the standard press enterprise line of cases from the, the Supreme Court that there is a constitutional right to those documents. Uh, and so in addition to our FOIA request, we were making a constitutional request. They get very puzzled when you write that letter <laughs> and, and, and many times act as if you just made a FOIA request. And so we actually twice sued over that where cause of action one, FOIA for the release of documents from the immigration court uh, and cause of action to the uh, constitutional right to it. And the government quickly mooted both cases by delivering the documents. Question? I think it could, it could help at the margins to have a constitutional standard to point to. Um, you know, the judges that are very deferential on FOIA requests might be marginally less deferential if there were a compelling interest, narrow tailoring uh, standard that had to be met. Um, but it's, it's hard to tease out how much of the deference that courts give to the executive is uh, a matter of judicial culture and how much of it is a matter of the actual standards they're applying. But on the downside, we wouldn't have a statutory right to attorney's fees. Right. <laughs> There's that too. <laughs> Questions from the audience? Yes. Let's get you on record, former member of the Obama administration. <laughs> um, I, was a, I was a former appointee in the Obama administration at Commerce, and we certainly dealt with our fair share of FOIAs. And just out of curiosity, are there agencies which are better, uh, because we wouldn't know internally, better at dealing with them um, and worse? And I'm no longer part of the administration, so this is you know, not at all on the record or anything like that. I have a 100% battery record with the GSA right now. I'm pretty happy with that. I've always heard that HHS is good, but I've never, I've never dealt with them, so I don't know. Uh, it was, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I, I have lots of problems with the FBI, um, and, and for reasons that, that strike me as being hostility, but perhaps I should expect that. They're hostile to everybody. Yeah, okay, I, I won't feel it personally. Just you. But there, there we, we were at a conference at, at Columbia in the spring about FOIA, and this FOIA officer who was speaking came up and said, oh, you know, I, we haven't talked to each other in a long time, and I didn't remember him at all. And he was at the FDA, and while he was speaking, I looked at my email, and there I had received 52 emails from him over a particular request. There are agencies that haven't emailed anybody in the world 52 times. And it, it, part of it was that they're very specialized, and a lot of their requests come from industry, and their FOIA office is, is professionalized to deal with very complicated scientific issues. I don't think you get that in, in many of the agencies. In the back. I'm giving Dan a workout today. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I, I can't resist uh, making an observation, which is that the kind of arrogance, um, if you will, that I heard in some of the, maybe not intentionally, in some of the comments that Cass Sunstein made, is, I think, part of the problem that leads to the anger that leads people to make a bad choice and vote for Donald Trump. And I think in a liberal community, we, you know, it'd be good for some people to think about that when pointing fingers about, you know, whose fault it is that Trump got elected. Um, I just a few days ago went to hear a talk by the owners and operators of a bookstore in Buffalo, New York called Burning Books. And the New York Times did a great story back in 2013, I commend you for it, about the postal, uh, U.S. postal mail covers that were put in place. And um, apparently you can just, you, all you have to do is call up the inspector general and you, you, know, you can get a, a mail cover on just about anybody. And the way they found out about it was a mistake made by an intern or something, a new, a new hire, uh, who just happened to put the mail watch slip in with the mail that was delivered. And they found out about it. And they ended up, they've been working with a, a, a lawyer in Buffalo who's, I think, well known in the field named Kuzma, who's done a lot of work on, on FOIA stuff. And he put in a letter after this, which he then FOIA'd to sort of help flesh out some of the details. But they are not yet at the point where they're going to be maybe doing any litigation about this, which they, they're hoping to eventually. 
how many years later, because they're still engaged in FOIA activity, trying to get more information, which gets to Mr. Sobel's point of, I think, of how difficult it is. You know, you, and Kuzma does this work pro bono. So I really want to, you know, maybe just bring this up, but maybe just to reinforce some things that have already been said by members of the panel. First of all, how difficult it is for ordinary people, how much money you need, a lawyer that happens to be sympathetic, how long they drag their feet. And I think, I forget what the percentage they think they have, maybe 3% of the documents that they think exist after years of, of litigation. And they're no, you know, who knows when they're gonna get to the point where they can actually say, you guys did something wrong when you did what you did to us, so. Yeah, I mean, you know, the one thing your story brings to my mind is how sort of inadvertent uh, events sort of necessarily have contributed to this process. So, you know, you go back to the COINTELPRO disclosures in the 70s, which resulted because there was a break-in at an FBI field office, and Carl Stern sees the, the word COINTELPRO, makes a request, and it all comes out. Um, you have this example that, that you're citing of sort of an inadvertent disclosure leading to these revelations. And I would point to the, the Snowden disclosures um, as, you know, sort of the best and most recent example. I mean, my organization was at the, in the process of litigating for the release of a foreign intelligence surveillance court opinion that was withheld in its entirety as top secret at the time that the, the Snowden disclosures were made. And as a result of what was disclosed, the, the, the Justice Department had to go back and do a declassification review, resulting in the release of 80% of that opinion, through which we learned, for instance, that the text of the Fourth Amendment had been withheld as top secret. So, so, <laughs> so you know, the, the process, you know, for better or worse, has been assisted by break-ins and leaks and inadvertent disclosures, and unfortunately, all of that stuff has to happen, apparently. Other questions? Jonathan. Yeah, hi, thanks, this was great. Um, I, wanna, I wanna go back to um, the point that you raised, David, about the, the Espionage Act and leak prosecutions in the next administration. Yeah. So, um, I'm just wondering how you're going to, you and other folks on the panel would approach counseling a national security reporter whose business it is to cultivate leaks and, and obtain classified information from sources, publish it. Um, you know, in the past it seems like the bargain has been reporters don't get prosecuted, they very rarely get subpoenaed. Um, you go to the administration, you, you give them a hearing, uh, you, you, list, you hear them out about why the information should be released, and then you make a judgment. And that's the way it works. Um, are you concerned that that bargain is going to break down? Um, are you more worried about potential prosecutions or investigations? Um, and is this, is this something that uh, we should all be on guard for? Yeah. I, I do think it's, it's one of those issues that we, can, that we should watch because an administration is making a policy decision, not a legal decision. It's clear after the Jim Rising case with Jeffrey Sterling that the government in a national security grand jury investigation has great freedom to subpoena reporters and go after their sources. So our protection becomes, in the absence of a federal shield law, our protection becomes the government's willing to stand down. And by and large, that was the record of the Obama administration. It was a very funny, bipolar sort of response is that they went after leakers more so than any other prior administration, but they did not, in making those cases, go after reporters. You may have noticed uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, General James Cartwright entered a guilty plea as part of a leak investigation. If you read the documents that were filed with that, he is accused, or he, was, he, he ended up pleading to, to misleading the FBI. But the underlying activity involved talking to a New York Times reporter. We never heard from the government during the entire investigation. It went on for years. The government never called, never sent a subpoena, <laughs> never asked for any cooperation. We never heard from him. And that was fairly typical throughout the Obama administration. And I think that in some ways, they, they, the government, the Obama administration, bought into the argument that the New York Times made during the Pentagon Papers argument 
New York Times lawyer, the Yale professor Alexander Bickel said, there is this disorderly situation in that the press, once it has information, has great freedom to publish it, and the government should have great power to control secrets, including disciplining employees and stopping leaks. And I think Obama bought into that conceptually. I don't know if the next administration is likely to follow suit. So you're confident that your phones weren't being tapped and your email wasn't being tapped. <laughs> yeah, maybe they didn't need to ask you. <laughs> you know, it has never popped up yet. It has never popped up. I keep waiting for it to show up in these cases. Would, would we see it? I mean, so, so we might be able to see it coming, too, right? Because one of the other things that came out, out of the um, investigation was a change to the attorney general's advising to the DOJ about when to seek information from reporters or when to seek information, I should say, from telephone companies about the telephones of reporters. Would we see it coming if there's a change there, or could that change just happen without us knowing that the Attorney General's advice went away? The, there, are, there are guidelines by DOJ, as Andy's saying, that, that DOJ is supposed to follow in doing investigations, and it is a policy that limits both coming to news organizations and coming to phone providers of news organizations. And I think there's probably still, despite renegotiating those over the last two years, enough wiggle room that they wouldn't actually formally have to withdraw the regs to get where they want to go. I think we'll wrap it up there. Thanks, Great. everyone. Thanks to Andy, Nani, Jamil, David, and David. And uh, thanks to all of you for sticking with us for the day. Um, let's give these guys a round of applause. Thanks.